Happy Media Literacy Week. Good evening and welcome to the Walrus Talks at Home, our digital lives presented by Media Smarts. My name is Jennifer Hollett and I am the Executive Director of the Walrus and we are thrilled to be joining you this evening across the country and beyond in conversation live. I'd like to start by acknowledging the land that I'm on. I come to you from downtown Toronto, Ontario, Canada, Toronto. This is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And we are honored to carry on a long tradition of storytelling and encourage you to take a moment to reflect on the land that you're on wherever you're joining us from tonight, the moment in history that we're in, and the ongoing work of truth and reconciliation. As part of that commitment to reconciliation, if you haven't, we encourage you to read the 94 calls to action recommended by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Bit more about the walrus. The walrus is committed to being a platform for Canada's conversation. Challenge, challenging, urgent, complex, and thoughtful conversations and bringing together a range of voices. And we do this in, in a number of different ways through our journalism in uh, print, but also of course, online at thewalrus.ca, through our podcast, The Conversation Piece, and in our public event series, The Walrus Talks, which is now The Walrus Talks at Home, My Home, and Your Home. And this work is powered by our donors, our supporters, and our partners. So thank you all for being here and to Media Smarts for making this event possible. We're really excited to welcome them as a partner for this event this evening. And this is all part of Media Smart's Media Literacy Week. To tell us more, I'd like to invite the Executive Director of Media Smarts, Catherine Hill, to the stage. Nice to see you. Good to see you too. So I have the wonderful opportunity to say a few words. So bonjour et bienvenue à vous toutes et tous pour cet événement ce soir. Uh, un spécial événement de la semaine d'éducation média. So welcome and thank you everyone for joining us today for this English language marquee event of our 16th annual Media Literacy Week. I'm the executive director of Media Smarts, and I want to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Ashnabig people. So Media Smarts is a registered charity. We've been a leader in digital and media literacy education for 25 years now. And through education, public awareness, research, and policy work, we strive to ensure that everyone can learn how to engage with media as an active and informed digital citizen. And Media Literacy Week is a national event that takes place each fall and puts a spotlight on the issues related to digital media literacy. This year, we have over 120 collaborating organizations taking part, libraries, museums, community groups across the country are participating. And you can learn more about all these activities taking place on our website at medialiteracyweek.ca. So the idea for tonight's talk grew from conversations we were having about how much has changed in regards to how we consume and how we interact with media since the pandemic began, which seems like such a long time ago. At Media Smarts, we're often asked to comment on issues like screen time or misinformation, and never more so than now. So I'm really looking forward to hearing our guest speakers' takes on the topic, and I'm also looking forward to hearing your comments and questions. And I also must take a moment to thank our partners and our sponsors, because this is just not possible without them. So our sincerest thanks to the Government of Canada, and the Canadian Commission for UNESCO, who are supporting this event in particular, as well as all our other Media Literacy Week sponsors, Bell, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. And we're also really lucky to have the support of teacher organizations from across Canada, including the Newfoundland and Labrador Teachers Association, the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association, the Alberta Teachers Association, and this Nova Scotia Teachers Union. Thank you to all the teachers out there. And thank you once again for joining us. And I'll now pass the mic back to Jennifer. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I've always big, been a big fan of Media Literacy Week. And you know, think back to taking a media English class, as it was called when I was growing up, and how transformational that was. 
As mentioned, tonight's conversation explores the very relevant, very now topic of media consumption and how digital literacy has really evolved in the past pandemic year and a half. In any conversation I've been a part of over the last few years, be it involving media or digital, dis or misinformation, it always comes back to media and digital literacy and the need for more of it formally in education, but also informally. It's not just for kids, it's for all of us. And in a world where anyone can become the media by creating a social media account or a podcast, things get blurry very easily. It's easier more than ever before to make things look official. And we see that with doctored images and the rise of deep fakes, which are basically fake videos, um, but the deepness comes from the use of artificial intelligence. So I encourage all of you to think about how and where you're learning about digital media, to identify the gaps in your own understanding because the technology is always changing. And I say as someone who worked at a tech company, even within the company, it's always changing. And to really use tonight as an opportunity to reflect on the last year and a half as we now work live and do basically everything online due to lockdowns and the length of the pandemic. Here's how the talks work. Each speaker has five minutes live. And once your head is full of new ideas, we're gonna have a moderated Q&A session with the speakers and you, our audience at home. So feel free to submit your questions at any point in the Zoom chat or via the comments section if you're watching on Facebook Live. Also, of course, we're gonna say this, it's you know digital, digital, digital please join and share the conversation on social media. You can tag us at the walrus on any of the platforms and use our hashtag, which is hashtag walrus talks, as well as the media literacy week hashtag, which is hashtag media lit WK short for week. Tonight, I'm really excited for these talks. We'll be hearing from Sara Chaudhry, a computer of a contributor of CBC, Kids News, Dr. Chris Dornan, a former associate professor, Carleton University School of Journalism and Communication, Matthew Johnson, director of education for Media Smarts, and Emil Niazi, culture critic and writer. Thanks again for joining us. And we're going to kick things off with Sara. Over to you. Hi, thank you so much. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sara Chaudhry. I'm a 17 year old contributor with CBC Kids News. I'm also an actor and a UNICEF youth advocate. Over the last year and a half, COVID-19 has affected young people like me in expected and unexpected ways. Whether it was being understandably scared and anxious when the pandemic first hit, or surprised by how much we missed the routine of school, we felt all the feels. But one experience has been pretty consistent, how the pandemic pushed us all to our screens. For the sake of our sanity, we flocked to social media platforms. Want proof? Children's recreational screen time has almost doubled during the pandemic. At the onset of the pandemic, TikTok downloads increased by 27% in the US not to mention the countless hours I know that kids in my circles spend on Instagram, Snapchat, FaceTime, Discord, Zoom, and other platforms. Some data also suggests that kids are willing to take more risks when they're with and being encouraged by peers, making us more susceptible to online challenges. So we tried new dance moves with every TikTok video Charlie D'Amelio and Addison Rae posted, stepped up to the milk crate challenge and still uh, seem to be responding to the hashtag devious licks challenge. But don't you worry, we're also tending to our gardens, virtually in the video game Animal Crossing that is. But the last year and a half hasn't just been about the pandemic. As we've all been fighting for our lives, literally, we have also been witnessing and participating in a revolution. After the murder of George Floyd and once the Black Lives Matter movement came to the forefront of everyone's attention, youth took a deeper interest in social change. While our generation has always been an outspoken one, 
as seen with notable teenagers like Greta Thunberg, we used our best and brightest tool, social media, to mobilize change for justice, equality, democracy, and the climate. In addition to our digital lives being a great source of entertainment, connection, activism, and information, in some cases, it's also been a tool for bettering ourselves. In a report published by the nonprofit organization Common Sense Media called Coping with COVID-19, How Young People Use Digital Media to Manage Their Mental Health, it demonstrated that social media has played a huge role in young people feeling more connected and in combating negative emotions. The report among social media users aged 14 to 22 years old showed that 53% say social media has been very important for staying connected to family and friends. And 43% say social media makes them feel better when they're depressed, stressed, or anxious. And while this is definitely a clear example of how social media can truly be of help when young people need it most, we cannot ignore the more unfortunate truths. Depression rates have increased significantly since 2018, especially when the pandemic hit. Depression was particularly prevalent among teens and young adults who were directly impacted by COVID-19 infections in their homes. Hate speech on social media is on the rise, and experts are suggesting that this could be affecting the increase in the negative mental health symptoms we're seeing in young people. For example, in 2018, the percentage of 14 to 17 year olds that reported they encounter racist, sexist, and homophobic comments on social media often was between 12 to 15%. And in 2020, that number increased to 21 to 23%. Just a few weeks ago, these concerns were brought to the forefront with the revelation that Facebook's, or as of today, now known as Meta's internal research, says its platforms can be harmful to kids at times. And now there's a growing movement to block or further limit kids on social media. Instagram for kids has been shelved. China is going a step further and is implementing time restrictions on young social media users. But that notion has given me pause to think. Is that what we should be focusing on? How social media harms kids? Don't get me wrong, kids need protection 100%, but don't we all? The issue is clearly broader and extends beyond just young people's social media usage. Just a year ago, there was another report by the Forum for Information and Democracy that called on 38 countries, including Canada, to regulate social media companies, to take a step back and look at how information is shared and promoted to all ages, not just kids. And I think that's a better place to start. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Chris Dornan, and I'm a retired professor in the School of Journalism and Communication at Carleton University. Um, it's oddly timely that Facebook should choose this moment to rebrand itself as Meta, a nod to the metaverse that it, that it wants to build. Because in the late 20th century, just as the internet was coming into being, cyberpunk science fiction authors like William Gibson and Neil Stevenson began to imagine that the metaverse would become so seductive that it would supersede the world of flesh and objects. So in Tad Williams' 1996 novel, Otherland, for example, the cy cyberspace has become so superior to reality that people come to psychically inhabit what amounts to a realm of electronic imagination, while the care and the administration of the real world has been allowed to deteriorate. Ethnic groups petitioned to have their customs and mores encoded in the software of the virtual universe as a means of preserving their cultures, which are dying back in the physical world. So the pandemic has brought in a, a version of that into being in which the plane of existence has migrated to the digital arena. What we mean by the public is a congregation of citizens, but at the onset of the pandemic, 
congregation was itself the major threat to the public good. In order to dull the rate of infection, we had to seal ourselves off from one another. Schools shut down, workplaces emptied, bars and restaurants, gyms and theaters were all shuttered at various points and, and for various durations. And yet for all that, a facsimile of life went on. Uh, although schools closed, education went on in a jury-rigged electronic classroom, perhaps, but it went on. And yes, there have been disruptions in the global supply chain, but everyday commerce continues, the machinery of industry being tended by people working remotely. Parliament continued to sit via Zoom, and the bureaucracy of the civil service continued to function. There may have been a global health emergency, but those parking tickets still have to be paid. Income tax returns still have to be filed and processed. And for an isolated, anxious population, there was at least the compensations of the screen. One might not have been able to be in the same room with loved ones or relatives, but you could still see them and talk to them. And while there was nothing fun about the pandemic, there were still communal entertainments to be had. Entire societies binged themselves on the Tiger King and Bridgerton and Squid Game. That's not to say that our lives have been merely inconvenienced by the pandemic. I think, for example, of the single mother whose job as a convenience store clerk meant that she had to leave the house every day and come into contact with scores of strangers, any one of whom might give her the, the, the disease, while her kids were left at home to do their remote schooling unsupervised, cut off from the contact with their friends that's so essential to young people. The pandemic has, made, has meant hardships whose toll we will only come to reckon once the crisis has passed. But as bad as it's been, imagine how much, how much worse it would have been had the pandemic occurred only 25 years ago. The state of the internet in 1996 simply wouldn't have allowed white collar workers to work remotely en masse. Empty offices would have meant closed businesses and closed businesses would have meant mass unemployment. The wheels of bureaucracy would have ground to a halt. Schooling, if it were to continue at all, would have meant children all but teaching themselves from textbooks. The social, economic, and psychological scarring of the pandemic, had it occurred 25 years ago, would have been infinitely worse. On the other hand, the same digital technologies that have allowed us to ride out the pandemic are also responsible for a form of social scarring. They've certainly complicated efforts to manage the emergency, if only by providing the deluded and the obstinate with a megaphone. Back in 1996, the public conversation wasn't just curated by agencies of authority that we called the mass media, it was conducted by them. They spoke and we listened. The mass media set the news agenda. They told us what was important. They drew the boundaries between the legitimate and the illegitimate. They provided a forum for public debate, but that debate was not carried out by members of the public. It was carried out by proxies newspaper columnists and politicians, academics and experts. In the world of 1996, public discourse would have been closed off to extremist hysterical views that undermined measures to manage the crisis. This isn't to say there wouldn't have been anti-maskers and anti-vaccine advocates, but the social responsibility of the news media would have denied them a platform for their militancy. The ascendance of the social media platform has liberated public discourse from the tyranny of the legacy media. Individual members of the public now have a public voice in a way that was unthinkable in the 20th century. And in many respects, this is exhilarating, it's emancipatory. But it also means giving license to crackpots, to bigots and bullies. Ignorance and prejudice now have the wherewithal to shoulder the way onto the public stage. The experience of the pandemic has pointed up something that the social media platforms had already set in motion, the erosion of trust, not only in authority, but in one another. Acrimony supersedes fellowship. What the social media companies promised us was a world of connectivity, but all too often, it's a connectivity of antagonisms. So the management of the public health crisis has also had to encompass the management of irrational dissent people whose beliefs and actions will only prolong and worsen the crisis. What's at issue here is not just an assault on public 
authority. I mean, Lord knows, from Jason Kenney to Boris Johnson, government leaders during the pandemic have given the public good reason not to trust them. It's that social media grant authority to clearly detrimental behavior. They let everyone speak their truths with the implication that all these different truths are equally legitimate. But some truths aren't truths at all. And no healthy society should grant legitimacy to demonstrably harmful conduct. The pandemic is itself a form of injury to the body politic. But it's also highlighted the social injury that the social media giants left to themselves have midwifed into the world. We know the antagonisms that flourish via Facebook and Twitter and Reddit and 4chan aren't good for us. We're painfully aware of the extent of cyberbullying and doxing and online stalking and the sheer venom of so much of what courses over the platforms. And if Facebook whistleblower Francis Hagen is to be believed, the hidden algorithms of the social media colossus are geared to stoking animosities and conflict because conflict generates attention and attention is the coin of social media profit. The problem is that we don't know what to do about it. Freedom of expression is core to liberal democracy. It's its central promise. The social media revolution granted freedom of expression to everyone, an unbridled universal freedom. To attempt to regulate that freedom smacks of authoritarianism, of an assault on liberty and democracy itself. But the pandemic has underscored that we can't go on like this. We will have to do something to try to contain the social damage without somehow imposing anti-democratic constraints on public discourse. So last year, the Public Policy Forum assembled what it called the Canadian Commission on Democratic Expression, a, a blue rib ribbon panel that spent nine months wrestling with just this issue. And when they reported this year, the commission argued that the time has come for some form of state regulation of the social media companies, although not all the commissioners were unanimous about what this should look like. But some form of intervention is clearly in the offing. Only last week, senior figures at Facebook wrote an op-ed article in the Globe and Mail that not only conceded that, but invited policymakers to collaborate with Facebook in fashioning a more regulated future. I don't know what the long-term future of social media holds, but if this is the state of digital media now, Lord knows what it's going to look like when it comes to be administered by next generation machine intelligence. But I am confident that tackling the ills that social media have visited upon us while preserving the good that they've made possible is going to be a public policy priority in the immediate term. Thank you. They say, oh, hi, my name is Matthew Johnson. I'm the director of education for Media Smarts. They say the future comes when you aren't looking. Certainly, a few years ago, not many of us could have imagined we'd be spending a fair portion of our lives doing video chats, which were then considered obsolete and mostly reserved for keeping in touch with friends and family far away. While we now talk about Zoom fatigue, the need to distance ourselves from each other has also shown us the importance of faces and voices in communication. Put another way, we've seen a dramatic demonstration of the importance of empathy. Facial expression and tone of voice, along with body language, are the main things that make us feel empathy for other people. When we're communicating online in other ways, such as texting or social media, we can't see or hear these. This means we're a lot more likely to misunderstand each other or to not notice when we've hurt someone's feelings. As a result, when we're online, empathy has to become not just a reflex, but a conscious practice. Remote schooling, meanwhile, made the question of when to give each child their own device irrelevant. Every child needed their own device just to attend school, while at the same time showing how many gaps remain in digital access across the country. These new devices highlighted privacy concerns as well. Some of these were dramatic, such as students being suspended for playing with a Nerf gun during online school or being subjected to eye tracking during online exams. But as worrying as those are, 
it is the subtler issues that will likely turn out to be more important, in particular, student surveillance. As is so often the case, the impact is usually felt more heavily by marginalized youth. LGBTQ students, for example, may be forced to self-censor or even be put at risk by device or browser surveillance, while non-white students are more likely to encounter problems with proctoring software. The way the pandemic reshaped our lives has also changed our understanding of screen time. When students were spending their school days in front of screens, it became clear that counting hours and minutes was an ineffective way of addressing screen use if the educational and social values of school outweigh any harms done by delivering it digitally, then other screen uses, whether they're creative activities or the digital socialization that served as a lifeline for so many students under quarantine, can as well. We're shifting now towards a more holistic way of looking at screen use that focuses on mindful use and on steering youth towards more meaningful and positive uses of screen devices. Mindful use of digital devices also means applying a critical eye to the content we see and engage with, the importance of which has been underlined by the pandemic and its accompanying infodemic. Today, disinformation doesn't only come from publishers, gatekeepers, and agenda setters such as politicians. Social media networks, influencers, and ordinary users play an important role, not just in spreading false information, but in originating it as well. As well as showing the real-world impacts of disinformation, the pandemic has shown us how even a topic like public health can become politicized in a media environment that favors opinion over news reporting and partisanship over critical thinking. While learning to find and recognize reliable information is even more essential than ever, we also have to embrace humility, being willing to consider that we might be wrong and to ask ourselves why we're inclined to believe or to distrust a particular message. In the end, that may be the biggest impact of the pandemic, the reminder that what we do as individuals makes a difference, both to those around us and to society as a whole. Contrary to the loud voices of a small number of conspiracy theorists and COVID-19 denialists, and despite the ways that the majority illusion and the man bites dog ethos of news media make them seem more numerous than they really are, Canada has consistently had super majority support for public health measures. We may come away from this period with a greater awareness of our obligations as digital citizens, both to share good content and to respond to dangerous misinformation when we see it. There can be no silver linings in something as painful and tragic as the COVID-19 pandemic, but difficult times can help us focus on the things that are most important to us. By bringing us more suddenly into a future that was already coming, the pandemic may give us the opportunity to re-examine our relationship with the technologies that have become an essential part of our lives. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emil Niazi. I'm a cultural critic, writer, and showrunner for Pop Chat CBC. You know, usually as a critic, I have some distance from what I'm writing about, but when the pandemic hit, all of that collapsed. And it felt like we were all instantly connected, both by our fear and anxiety of the unknown, but also by what we turn to for comfort and community. Some experts called the pandemic the great equalizer because rich or poor, you were suddenly forced inside living and working in much the same way. I don't necessarily stand by the notion that what we all experienced was equal over the past year and a half, but certainly one thing that did connect us was the media that we consumed. We went from Schitt's Creek to Squid Game over 18 months and tweeted and posted about it all online. What does that trajectory say about our collective state of mind, about how we're feeling and where we're going? If we go back to March 2020, we were reaching back. We sought out nostalgic remnants of the before times. We rewatched New Girl and The Office, and as things worsened, 
We sought solace in slower, tender shows like Schitt's Creek, a perfect distillation of simplicity and optimism in the face of massive change. That show in particular became a touchstone. The Rose family suddenly became a necessary source of joy, a way to break up the sense of panic, and finally, a reason to stop doom scrolling for at least 30 minutes. And speaking of doom scrolling, Twitter itself became a living document of our experiences, a way to dissect and disseminate new information. People shared their harrowing experiences with the virus, checked case counts hourly, posted photos of our ever increasing screen times clocked by our iPhones. I myself spent hours on the app every day, sharing my fears as a freelancer, as the mother of a toddler, and of my increasing anxiety of giving birth in the middle of a pandemic. But social media and WhatsApp helped connect me to other pregnant women where we shared updates on who was allowed into the hospital with us, the protocols at birthing centers, and what extra precautions we should be taking. Strangers on Twitter even sent me postpartum aids I couldn't get in Canada. Someone mailed me a care package for the hospital. These are people that I had never met. And after I gave birth to my daughter in the summer of 2020, I was compelled to share a photo of the two of us on Twitter right after it happened. That's something I never would have done pre-pandemic. But the people on this app had become as close to me as anyone else in the last year, part of my community of care. And once the summer came, we started to turn away from nostalgia. As Black Lives Matter protests took over city streets following the murder of George Floyd, it suddenly felt necessary to engage with social media in a different, more urgent way. People posted Black squares and demanded allyship in a very visual, present way. Reality TV, something that we all consumed a lot of last year, got a big dose of reality itself and was forced to reckon with everything happening in the world. And because of that engagement with reality, it suddenly became some of the most compelling television. Real housewives and rich trust funders on big Bravo reality shows that had previously been mindless diversions like Below Deck and Southern Charm had to have uncomfortable but meaningful conversations in real time. And it was incredible to watch. The winter was bleak, but enter Ted Lasso. Even though the show premiered in August, it took off closer to the end of the year when we were desperate for optimism and hope and once again sought out tenderness. But the emergence of a vaccine turned social media back into a critical resource. In Ontario, intrepid Twitter accounts made it possible for thousands of people to find appointments and obtain their jabs in a timely way. Social media was a lifeline, a survival mechanism. And now as we are slowly making our way back to the old world, uh, attempting to reclaim the past, uh, a cynicism has sort of come to dominate our consumption. Last year at this time, we were embracing Ted Lasso. A year later, we're asking ourselves why we ever fell for the show in the first place, as the rejection of the show's second season reveals the looming collective anger, frustration, and exhaustion with what the pandemic has revealed. The inequality that we can no longer ignore is the elephant in the room, and it colors our media. So it makes sense that as we close out a second year of this pandemic, a show about desperation, inequity, and the fight for survival in a cold capitalist climate is the most popular show in the entire world. Yes, I'm talking about Squid Game, which hit number one in 90 countries, reaching hundreds of millions of households. The show comes at a time when the pandemic is changing again. And like I said, we're slowly returning to how we used to live. But because of the past 18 months and everything we've seen, we're confronting that world and ourselves with new eyes. What we watch has changed, but in return, we have changed the content that we consume, demanded it be more reflective of what we've experienced. And I'm excited to see where this will take us and how it will not only inform the media we make, but how we make it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emil. And to recap, our talkers from start to finish, thank you to Sara Chaudhry, Dr. Chris Dornan, Matthew Johnson, and just now, Emil Niazi.
All right, this is where we get into it. I'm excited to open up this conversation. I want to shout out our members of the audience. We have folks registered from all over, including Canmore, Fairbanks, Regina, Chelsea, and Sackville. Hi, everyone. Great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, if you have a question for this Q&A, just put it in the Zoom chat box. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you could add it to the comments. I'll now invite all of our talkers back to turn on their cameras, and I have some questions to start our conversation. So much reflection, and it's definitely helping me make sense of what we just went through together. Uh, my first question is for Sara. You highlighted the impact of the pandemic on youth, but you said really on all of us, right? Like, I, I take your point. I think why we worry about young people is because in a way, like we're a lost cause, which is not true, um, but uh, kids and screens, right? We're all spending so much time on screen. So what's the biggest challenge with our amount of screen time, but also on the flip side, what's the opportunity with it? I mean, you're, you're absolutely hitting the nail on the head. I mean, screen time is such a huge issue with kids. I mean, I, my, speaking from my own experience, I find myself getting notifications on my phone saying you've reached six hours of screen time for the day, eight hours of screen time. If I'm, you know, particularly busy more sometimes. Um, so I mean, at least in my circle, I know that kids are really making use of the resources that they do have, which is what is already um, implemented in, in the software on our phones, which is having those screen time limits. Um, and I think kids are really smart. Um, we know um, the negative impacts of screen time. We also know when our screens are impacting us positively and we're using them in, in a manner that benefits us. But um, I think a lot of us are trying to implement those screen time limits um, and, and really just use our social media, um, our laptops just for school and stuff whenever, whenever it really serves us and whenever it's beneficial uh, and turn it off when, when we start to feel the negative impacts of it. It's a great reminder that there are our tools and um, the ability to hold ourselves and our friends accountable as well. I think that goes a long way. And I will say, I know kids often remind their parents, hey, no phones at the table, right? So it's, it's, it's two way, that piece. Excellent. Chris, you mentioned, you know, cyberpunk, and I, I just love the reference um, because it shows the history of this arena. Uh, as well as highlighted the challenges of the pandemic and what's happening on social media. What is so seductive about cyberspace, you know, to use some of the terminology? And are we now just living a sci-fi reality? Because this is what so many people wrote about and put in movies and, and books for so long. And, and here we are. I don't think we're living in the sci not the sci-fi reality that was imagined by the cyberpunk authors. It, uh, but you know, obviously, yeah, yeah, well, they imagined a, a, a cyberspace that was so far, uh, so more enticing, uh, so more, uh, so far superior to, you know, the, either the humdrum daily life or the pains and injustices of daily life. If you, you could escape into this built world, uh, a, a world constructed to be the world that you wanted to live in. If you, if you see, uh, uh, you know, just today, uh, Mark Zuckerberg made a little video to roll out what he means by, by meta and by the metaverse. And that's basically what, he, what he's promising. He's promising this, this uh, kind of word, world that's kind of scrubbed clean of, uh, you know, all the faults and ills of of day-to-day -day existence that, that remains um, a kind of you know a fantasy the, the the cyberspace that we occupy is uh is basically a kind of a cauldron of human interaction and it comes with uh you know all the foibles and and uh, you know challenges of of, of human interaction. They, they, uh, so, uh, and, you know, we do, uh, we occupy a kind of screen world, but it, it's not this uh, idyllic uh, fantasy that has been, you know, was supposed by other imaginations. Thank you for that. Uh, Matthew, 
the pandemic has really mainstreamed how we use tech. Why do you think we were so resistant to working online, governing online, doing business online, learning online at this scale before? Because that's the point you talked about the positive, right? Like, look at what we can now do, but like we, we could have done it two years ago. I think there are a couple of different reasons. One of it is that there simply wasn't um, there wasn't the impetus to do it before. Uh, we were doing things very much in a piecemeal way. Um, you know, there certainly were some workplaces where remote work was possible. There was some movement towards governments making more services available digitally, towards telehealth, that kind of thing. Um, but sometimes you really do need, in a way, a, a huge shock to, to push something forward. Uh, and I'll say, I mean, it's not an unmixed good, you know, the fact that um, that it's possible now to always be at work uh, it has a lot of, of mental health concerns and a lot of, of just, uh, you know, workplace concerns in terms of, of work, you know, safe and healthy work practices. But it really has made it necessary. It's in a way comparable to the way the the Cold War spurred the space race, you know, the, the, those technologies could have been developed um, without that, but they were accelerated by the need of the two powers or the, the perceived need to outdo one another. And that's kind of what we have here, except of course, there's there's only the one, <laughs> there's the human race and there's the, vi the virus. But uh, it, it is very similar where we have had this push uh, that's forced us to not even develop new technologies in this case, but really to lay down the infrastructure and adapt and adopt the technologies that were already there. Yeah, now the challenge is to build from that. Uh, Emil, I'm a big fan of your work, and I love the deep analysis on pop culture and what it says about us. I'd love to learn a little bit more on how streaming services with social media has changed the shows that we decide to binge, the shows that we decide are a hit because there've just been like so many surprises and delights during the pandemic. And I think it's because of the online conversations about what we watch. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the Netflix algorithm certainly um, practices some dark magic that manages to push certain content to the front of the page um, and shapes what you decide to watch. Um, and I think that happens often with shows where you're surprised that it's number one and you've never heard of it um, and you've probably never seen it, but there it is. Um, I think what sort of changed that was Squid Game. Um, it was one of those shows that came, seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, and within four days, it was the number one show in the US which is remarkable if that's the first time that a non-English show has had that status. And uh, the conversations about Squid Game on Twitter, on TikTok, on social media absolutely shaped our curiosity about it and the, the incredible rise of popularity of that show is just remarkable. And I think a lot of it does have to do with the conversations that we had about it online. And I think it's certainly going to be um, a model for shows going forward. And I think what's great about it is the fact that, again, that it, it's non-English um, and it managed to reach audiences everywhere in India and in Pakistan, in you know the Middle East, it, it, 90 countries, it went number one. And that's just incredible. And, and I think that part of the reason, of course, like I said, is, is the conversation that took place online, but it's also um, the resonance of the topics, um, the resonance of the themes behind the show, desperation, capitalism, the need to survive, to feed your family, to, um, to save yourself. I think that's also really interesting. And I think that that's uh, utterly tied to what we have just experienced in the last 18 months. Yeah, I, I joke when I watch The Bachelor, why am I watching this? To figure out why I'm watching this, right? I, I think that TV and pop culture always gives us a reflection of back. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you to our audience for the questions. I'm going to get to a few now. Do you see an increase of attention deficit syndrome and lack of 
concentration in the general public. You know, this is in response to all the time we're spending on, on digital. Uh, Matthew, curious to hear your thoughts, especially, you know, with media literacy in, in, in mind. How do, how do we balance it? Like, how is it changing who we are? Yeah, I don't think there's been an increase uh, sort of at, at the clinical level. Um, certainly, uh, I, I serve on the Canadian Pediatric Society's Digital Health Task Force, and we had a, a meeting two weeks ago uh, to review the, the guidelines for young children. And there's no discussion of that coming from the, the, the practicing uh, pediatricians that I am talking to. But there's no question that for all of us, um, our attention is more divided um, uh, because, again, it's the always on society. Um, and it's the, it's the blurring of the line between uh, work and home. Um, you know, the, the, that overly smooth transition between using the screens for fun and you, or rather using them for work and using them for fun. Um, and again, it's, it's not a new phenomenon, but it's highlighting, uh, it's throwing into relief uh, the way that we all need to be more mindful in our use of technology. It's making us more aware of this because this is something that we've been dealing with to greater or lesser extents. Um, whether we're working in an office and trying to resist you know, going over to another tab to check Twitter, whether you're a student in a lecture hall trying to take notes while your social network app is on in the background, this is a really fundamental life skill and is going to continue to be one for the foreseeable future that all of us have to develop. Um, and again, it's something that has been brought, I think, more to the forefront, more to our attention. And if that brings us to a greater awareness of it, then you know, that's obviously for the good. But it's something that we're all, I think, are very nearly all struggling with at this time. Yeah, and I think we've seen some good examples of how you can set norms in a classroom or in a meeting, whether it's on Zoom or in person or even with your friends, right? Like in, in terms of someone pulls out the phone and be like, hey, <laughs> you know, like we'd love just to chat and put our, our phones away. So we, we get to ship that as well. Emil, a follow-up question for you. Uh, interesting trend from Lasso to Squid Game, charting our views in society. This audience question wants to know, what's the next genre? Any idea? I mean, I think, I imagine it's gonna get a little darker um, as we go into winter, um, you know, the vaccine, masks, all of these things have been heavily politicized. That seems to only become increasingly divisive. We've got supply chain issues. We've got, you know, concerns about inflation. I think that, you know, I hate to sound so cynical, but I think we're looking at another bleak winter and um i think the the shows that we watch will reflect that um does that mean that we'll go back to something like nostalgic rewatches and shows like ted lasso or will we find ourselves looking for things like parasite and squid game that actually reflect where we're at um i think we're increasingly ready to face what we're up against rather than retreat into nostalgia so my opinion is that the shows we watch are going to get a little, little bleaker, a little scarier. Well, then also too, people are trying to write the next Squid Game, whether that's part two or the next piece in that trend. So that will definitely have an influence as, as well. This is a question to anyone on our panel with information coming to us in you know, every direction from so many different sources and feeds. Why do you think digital literacy is so important? Because even as we talk about digital literacy, I, I think it's something we don't focus on enough. Maybe we assume we know it um, or we're not even sure where to start. But like, why should we be thinking about digital literacy? Chris? Oh, I think uh, because they, you know, the, 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 these are tools that we, we require uh, to cultivate in people so that they can be aware of the, the kind of digital information stream in which we are now immersed. Um, there was a, a, an interesting question from an audience member who pointed out that uh, 
uh, partly, we, we, we are correct to focus on, on media literacy for young, for children and young people, but it may be equally necessary to focus on, on media literacy in this ever-changing digital world for our older population who, who feel kind of uh, bewildered by this and excluded uh, from a world that is accelerating past them like, like a freight train. Well, uh, Sarah, I'd like to bring you into that because, you know, you explored that in your talk. What can the different generations learn from each other? Yeah, I mean, speaking from personal experience, I, I think there's a lot that we can learn from each other. Um, just yesterday, my grandparents were sitting down at the dining table with us and asking me questions about how to work their phones. Um, you know, there, there was an email that came through uh, uh, in, in my grandma's inbox and it was definitely a scam and she, she didn't understand. And, and there's just like simple things like that, that young people um, who are just more familiar with how things operate online, um, they understand how to navigate it far more than our, our older generations. Um, and, and I think that, you know, if we can and work towards a future where our young people um, have empathy towards, towards older generations and are able to share their knowledge um, freely without, you know, thinking that um, th their memes and, and uh, knowledge about social media is uh, exclusive to them and just share it with their grandparents or people that they're around. Um, I think we could move towards somewhere where all generations are enjoying so social media um, and are using the internet to benefit themselves each in their own way without any you know, limitations or restrictions based on uh, a lack of knowledge. I think that's why so many popular TikToks have a parent or a grandparent in there because yeah. they're the most authentic on TikTok, right? But it, it also shows the people in our, our lives and um, kind of embracing new ideas because there will always be something new for all of us, right? There'll always be a younger generation coming up. Uh, another great audience question, how might our digital experience be shaped today had COVID not happened? So this is the flip of our theme tonight. Uh, Matthew, I see you smiling, like any ideas? So obviously we can't go back in, in, in time, but it, it, it's been dog years in the pandemic, right? I feel we are just so far ahead. You know, I think it, it really was, as I've said, I think we were headed in this direction anyway. I think um, we just got there sooner. Um, and as I said, that's an opportunity because it makes it more visible to us. So I think what would have been different without the pandemic is that all these changes would still be happening. Um, but they'd be happening more slowly, more gradually. And uh, of course, you know, it's the parable of the, the frog in the, in the pot. If you put the frog in hot water, it'll jump out. If you uh, heat the water slowly, the frog doesn't notice. So, you know, I think we would be the frog that maybe wasn't noticing how things were changing um, rather than having the opportunity to really take stock of how things have changed over the last 18 months. The poor frog. <laughs> uh, Emil, is there any turning back, right? Like it's, it's especially when it comes to pop culture and in, in, in media, you know, do we go back to the way things were? Is that even possible? No, I, I don't think so. Um, I think that we, we shouldn't go back. This is an opportunity to, to reflect on what's been keeping us back from some of these changes on the barriers, on accessibility, on inequality. And I think that this is necessary and important and we should face it head on. And, you know, change is good. Um, there's been a lot of darkness and, and a lot of loss and a lot of anxiety and fear, but uh, on the flip side, there is an opportunity to create change and to ride this wave. And, and no, I don't think we should go back. I think, you know, a squid game might seem like a, a dark future, but <laughs> I think we can still shape, um, shape what we have. And I actually think it would be detrimental to, to everything that we've learned and everything we've gained um, to, go, to go back. 
Wow, we have covered so much. Uh, thank you to our audience for all the questions and to our talkers. Uh, we really appreciate all of your insights. Again, thank you to Sara Chaudhry, Dr. Chris Dornan, Matthew Johnson, and Emil Niazi. If you enjoyed this event, we have more. On November 16th, we'll be hosting the Walrus Talks at Home Ingenuity. And on November 23rd, Brain Canada presents the Walrus Talks at Home Youth Mental Health. You can also join us on December 1st for Innovative Medicines Canada presents the Walrus Leadership Forum on Life Sciences. Check in with us at thewalrus.ca slash events. You can browse our schedule. You can register for upcoming events. We also take all the videos, including the videos from tonight, and we feature them in the Walrus Talks video room on our website. Also, keep an eye on your inbox. We're going to send you an email to say thanks, but it's the best way to stay in touch with us. Opt into our newsletter. Uh, we don't send too many emails, but then you can know what we're working on and join us at future events. We've also just launched our fall fundraising campaign. This is the time of year when we come to our community for support. So if you enjoyed this free event, uh, if we were back in the old world or in person in the new world, you'd probably buy a ticket for it and you wish to share your support, please consider donating. Just go to thewalrus.ca and click on donate. We are registered charity. So all donation, $20 or more, receive a tax receipt. Thank you again to Media Smarts, Catherine Hill, Trisha Grant, and the team for making tonight's conversation possible. Thank you as well to our annual sponsors, Inspire, Labatt Breweries of Canada, Air Canada, Shaw, and Facebook Canada. As we discussed, community is really important in these COVID times, and each one of you is part of the walrus. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great evening.